Thanks for joining us here on Eye on Africa, our daily look across the continent. Coming up. The trial opens in Ivory Coast over the 2016 jihadist attack at the Grand Bassam Beach Resort outside Abidjan. 19 people were gunned down in an assault claimed by Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Hundreds protest in South Africa against the upcoming release of Janusz Wolosz, the man who murdered anti-apartheid leader Chris Hani in 1993. The move has sparked angry opposition. On Tuesday, he was stabbed in the Pretoria prison and is receiving treatment. And heartbreak for Tunisia at the World Cup in Qatar. The Carthage Eagles took a hugely symbolic win over world champions France, but were denied a spot in the knockout stages as Australia beat Denmark to win the other Group D decider. I'm James Mulholland. Good to have you along with us this evening. First up in Ivory Coast, the trial has begun of 18 people accused of involvement in the 2016 jihadist attack at the Grand Bassam Beach Resort near Abidjan. 19 people were killed in the machine gun assault, which was claimed by Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Only four defendants appeared on Wednesday at the court in the economic capital. The others, including the suspected masterminds, are either on the run or in detention in Mali. Sophie Lamotte and Sajia Manjo have the latest from Abidjan. Out of the 18 accused in the Grand Bassam 2016 terrorist attack case, only four appeared in court on Wednesday. 30 witnesses made the trip for the opening of the trial, relieved, six years after the tragedy, to stand at the doors of justice. This mother regrets her son never got psychological support after the attack. For a year, he lost so much because he was traumatized. When he heard a noise in the street, he would jump, like he was going crazy. The attack came as a shock for Ivorians, but also for the country's economy. This waitress works at L'Etoile du Sud, one of the worst hit spots during the attack. She says business never picked up as usual after that day. Just yesterday, a client asked us, is this where the attack took place? You see that people are still afraid to come, and those who come still fear to stay. In Grand Bassam, the tourist industry is crippled, but residents feel they have a duty to remember. At least once a year, they organize a memorial march, this year, on the International Day for Peace. We never forget. We always remember the 13th of March. This attack pushed Grand Bassam into a state of grief. It hurts, but we forgive. 19 civilians and three military died in the shooting. At the time, the terrorist group Al-Qaeda and the Islamist Maghreb took responsibility for the crime. Authorities believe justice is a prerequisite for healing. We believe in justice. We are confident this crime will not go unpunished. Survivors are awaiting a verdict, expected at the end of the trial, which should last three weeks. East African leaders have held another round of talks to end fighting with rebels in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. Kenya's ex-president Uhuru Kenyatta on Wednesday opened the third inter-Congolese dialogue in Nairobi. A ceasefire between Congolese forces and M23 rebels in North Kivu province appears to be holding, but the mainly Tutsi rebel group at the heart of the ceasefire dialogue was again not invited to the talks. Vivian Wandera has more. Former President Uhuru Kenyatta, who is also the facilitator of the peace process, hailed 53 rebel groups that had agreed to the conditions of the ceasefire and put down their arms. Kenyatta continued to state that this peace process is not to pave way for any foreigners to come and lead the DRC because the DRC belongs to the people of Congo. He added that for the process to be successful, the people of Congo must forgive and accommodate each other. Here is more of what he had to say. Some of you who are here today were not here the first time around. My prayer to you is that you follow the footsteps of your brothers and sisters who were here and accept that you can also see the benefits of putting down your weapons and engage in dialogue like good neighbors. What we are discussing here are issues to do with Congo and to find a political solution to these problems. Some people might say that other countries are involved. I don't want to mention them. Our process in Nairobi is political consultations with groups from Congo. 
wengine labda wataweza kusema sijui kuna inchi hii kuna inchi hii mimi sitaki kutaja Professor Saad Chibangu, a representative of the DRC government, reiterated the comments made by President Kenyatta and said that the DRC sovereignty must be respected. The professor added that this will be the last of the peace processes and they will not extend any leniencies to armed groups that have not participated. He also continued to state that the peace talks are not exactly about M23 only and that there will be a justice transitional system to hold people accountable for their actions. These talks with civil groups and armed groups will continue until Saturday. Mandela in Nairobi there. Now to South Africa, where hundreds of people have protested in Pretoria against the upcoming release of the murderer of anti-apartheid leader Chris Hani. 69-year-old Janusz Walusz, a Polish immigrant, was to be released by Thursday after being granted parole by the Constitutional Court. The controversial decision sparked angry opposition, including from the South African Communist Party, which has petitioned the court to reverse its ruling. On Tuesday, Valush was, was stabbed inside the prison where he spent the past 28 years. Caroline Lambole has more. Chanting, don't kill Chris Henney again, demonstrators gathered outside this prison in Pretoria on Wednesday. They're protesting the scheduled release of Janusz Valush, the convicted killer of the anti-apartheid leader. Valush is due to be released on parole on Thursday. He is held as a martyr by racists of our country, by racists of the world. We do not know why they kill, they kill us. We don't know what other massacre they are planning against our people. We believe that Chris Ani gave his life for this country and the manner in which the court judgment was released amounted to almost killing him for the second time. Hani's assassination in 1993 sparked fierce violence in South Africa. It came amid negotiations to end apartheid. Following his killing, Nelson Mandela appeared on national television to appeal for calm. At a protest in Cape Town on Wednesday, his grandson said Vellish should be locked up for life. Good Chris was very close and dear to my grandfather, His Excellency President Nelson Holitha Thamande. And uh, this release of a murderer, of a hero of our struggle for liberation, invokes pain, full memories of the past. We remember the body of Chris Ani laying there, covered in blood, with his daughter looking on, with his family looking on. On Tuesday, Valish was allegedly stabbed by a fellow inmate. Prison authorities said he was stable and that an investigation was underway. He will serve the rest of his sentence on parole in South Africa. Finally, at the World Cup in Qatar, Tunisia have taken a famous win against world champions France. French-born Wahmi Hazri sent Education City Stadium into rapture when he scored the only goal of the game. But there was heartbreak on the horizon for the Carthage Eagles as minutes later, Australia put one park past Dark Horse's Denmark to win the other Group D decider. That left Tunisia in third spot and out of the World Cup. Let's discuss this a little more now with our sports editor, Jean-Emil Jamin, who joins us now in the studio. Jean-Emil, this was a huge win for Tunisia, but, but bittersweet, obviously. What were some of the key moments for you? Too little, too late. Uh, and it's just down to their goal-scoring prowess. You mentioned Frenchborn uh, Wabi Kazri from Montpellier, uh, one of 10 um, uh, Tunisians who were born actually on the uh, French mainland. So uh, a very strong French contingent there. Great to get a result over their former colonial power. But uh, as I mentioned, just in front of goal, they've been lacking throughout the tournament. Uh, not great uh, in their previous matches, uh, especially that loss to Australia. That was the one which really uh, put the nail in their proverbial football coffin. Uh, you, of course, must be very happy as an Australian, but uh, for the African teams, uh, yeah, just uh, not enough in front of goal for Tunisia themselves. Uh, but certainly they can take heart, you know, uh, their team under Jalil Khadri. Uh, it's, it's been quite a difficult uh, preparation for this World Cup. Uh, they edged into it in the qualifying stages um, and certainly they can maybe look to build for the future uh, for the 2026 edition. I must admit, I do have a small smile on my face uh, as an Australian. Very proud of our boys. A uh, very hard-fought win again today. But we are all four African teams here on Iron Africa. So, so next up, we've got uh, Senegal, who's obviously qualified for the knockout stages. What else do we have look, to look forward to for African teams? Well, uh, before going into this tournament, we all mentioned how difficult the groups were that the Africans were placed in. Uh, uh, I mean, really, it's some 
very tough, tough uh, uh, opposition that they're going to be facing, none more so than Ghana, who is playing uh, the old enemy from 2010, Uruguay, on uh, Friday. And uh, that is a game, a must-win game for both sides. Uh, they can join Portugal in the last 16. Uh, Ghana, of course, with the likes of Mohamed, uh, Mohamed uh, Kudus and the Ayu brothers, Thomas Partey, you know, these are very strong players. They should be quite confident of at least getting a draw. That win last time out against South Korea, what a magnificent result for them. Uh, as well as Cameroon, well, they came back from 3-1 down against Serbia. Very tough as well, might I say, but with the likes of Vincent Abubakar, uh, Karl Toko Ewakambi up front, they've always got goals in them. Then again, they are playing Brazil, who are much fancied to take the trophy uh, on, as a whole. So uh, Brazil, they're already through. So they might be like France, play a second string team. Cameroon might have an edge there, uh, but they've still got to get more goals than the Swiss uh, in their game against Serbia or Serbia against the Swiss. So that's all dependent. Very tough for Cameroon to get through. Morocco, they are the dark horses now, we can safely say, after that magnificent 2-0 win against Belgium. And they play on uh, third. Thursday. So, uh, and against Canada, it, you have to say on paper, it's a very winnable game for Morocco and you could see them uh, joining Croatia potentially in that last 16. Belgium, of course, can still qualify should they get a result over the Croats, but Morocco can be confident. Okay, let's look forward then to the last 16. Senegal playing England on Sunday. England haven't been great so far. Is this maybe a good sign for Senegal? Well, they did get six past Iran, but that was a very psychologically uh, almost disturbed Iran at the time. I mean, they were going through a lot. So England, they, they do have goals in them and they got three against Wales, of course. Uh, they do, they pose a mag massive threat. But as long as you've got the likes of Khalidou Koulibaly at the back, Edward Mendy, when he's on form for Senegal, the best goalkeeper in the world, but when he's on form, they are also going to be maybe lacking goals. So I do fear for Senegal, the lines of Teranga and Aliou Cisse, they are experienced. They do know how to win crunch matches, but could England be a step too far? It remains to be seen. I, I do have my worries, but we are always hopeful for our African uh, teams in the World Cup. And plenty more to come indeed for the, from the African teams here at the World Cup in Qatar. Thanks very much to Jean Emile, our sports editor. And that brings us to the end of this program. Thanks very much from Ion Africa. Don't go away. The international headlines are up next.